It's go time. Welcome to Go Time, your source for diverse discussions from all around the Go community. Thanks to our partners for helping us bring you the best developer pods each and every week. Fastly.com, Fly.io, and Typesense.org. Okay, here we go. Welcome to Go Time. Uh, today we're talking about simplicity, what it is, how it applies to writing software in Go, and hopefully finishing up with some practical principles to help you write simpler software. With me today is Chris, who really needs no introduction. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. It's a, it's a sunny but cold day. It's, it's, it's nice, though. It was brisk out this morning. We also have Sam Boyer, a longtime guest of the podcast. How have you been doing? I've been doing pretty well. Glad to be back. All right, let's just dig right in. Uh, so what is simplicity? Rob Pike had this great talk, Simplicity is Complicated, uh, where he says, simplicity is the art of hiding complexity. He goes on to give garbage collection as an example, where under the hood, the garbage collector is extremely complex, but to the users, it's really simple. It doesn't even have, a, doesn't even have an API. So do you agree with Rob? Is simplicity the art of hiding complexity, or is there more to it? What do you all think? I think there's more to it. <laughs> but I can I can happily say not wrong. Not wrong. Okay. That's a good starting place. Yeah. So to me, simplicity is kind of like a straight line, right? Versus hopping through hoops and that sort of thing. Does anyone have a better definition? I mean, I feel like Sam just has there's a whole the whole <laughs> spiel a whole spiel that Sam has. I, I, I feel like some rich hickey is gonna get brought up here. Oh, that's the first thing I'm doing. Yeah. So, um, okay. Okay. Go, go for it. Go for it. Let's hear it. Yeah. Well, I mean, so that's the first question I, I want to ask. I mean, Rich Hickey gave this talk 17 lifetimes ago in software terms called Simple Made Easy. And it feels like the first thing to talk about is just what, what the difference is. What do we think the difference is between those things? Simple and easy. I have a theory. I could go or not. I mean, I, I guess I could give my, my perspective on this of like, um, Oh God. Yeah. This is, this is hard for me to articulate, but like simple can be hard, right? So it's like getting to something that is simple can sometimes take a lot of energy and effort. And sometimes things that are simple are not say a, a synonym be like beginner friendly, right? It can be confusing and difficult and challenging to interact with something simple. Whereas easy is just kind of like the, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I can define them, but not in terms of each other. And I'm sure you have something, Sam. You definitely have something. So uh, just go for it. That was, that, was a, that was a bad attempt. Go, go. Just no, go. no, 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 no. It's uh, not at all because um, it, is, it is hard. So I, I think what one thing we can note about the difference between simple and easy, and that talk starts by talking about words, which I love talking about too. And it's part of the reason I love the talk. Um, it's the history of words. But simple is something which, at least arguably, can be just like a property of a system. Something is simple whether or not there is someone there experiencing it. Easy is saying inevitably something about a person, a user of a system and their experience of interacting with it. Did they have an easy time doing it? It's one of the few clear things we can say. Uh, and I actually do think it, it ends up being pretty difficult to talk directly about simplicity without getting back to some agent experiencing it. But I do think it's worth at least sort of starting from separating out these concepts because I mean, you know, some of the other stuff that we can say about this, like if we're, if we're going to talk, that's the, it's the art of hiding away complexity, right? Well, the question is how, how leaky is that abstraction that you made? Usually if you're going to hide away that complexity, is that something that somebody else needs to unhide later because you made choices in the way that you hit away that complexity that wasn't great. We'll start there. I could say more, but yeah. Yeah. I feel like for the, the simple versus easy component, it does. I like, I like that comparison of like a property of a system versus a property of a, of a entity experiencing that system. Cause I feel like that puts it kind of on like a, not purely objective, but like objective versus subjective spectrum where it's like, 
what is easy for one person might not be easy for another. But that doesn't necessarily mean that just because it's not easy for someone that the system isn't simple. And similarly, you can have very complex systems that some people find easy, even if they are still like very complex. And maybe that's kind of a, there's a, an element here of like group sizing as well. So perhaps we get more towards something that is simple, the larger number of people that find it to be easy. I feel like there's probably some relation there as well. But yeah, I, I like Rob Pike's definition of simplicity kind of being about, you know, hiding some of this complexity because I think there is inherent complexity in the world and you can't always just reduce it down. You can't, you know, turn all of the complexity into simplex things. I think attempts of doing that wind you up with uh, very noisy APIs and things like that, where you're like, well, everything is its own little world, own little piece. You got to assemble all the pieces together. So I think part of it is about taking complexity and putting simplicity around it. But that is, I think part of it is doing it in a way that isn't leaky. I feel like if you, if you, make a simple, say, interface for something, and it leaks the complexity out, I feel like then it's not simple. Like, you you failed at your goal of making it simple. Right? I feel like the garbage collector is a good example of the trade-offs here. Like, you can't tune it. You can't do a lot with it. It's what you got. You don't really get to tell it what to do for the most part. I think there's, like, a knob or maybe, like, two knobs to adjust what it will do. And they could have made it, they could have exposed more of that complexity to make it so you could get more closer to what you want, but that would have made probably it harder to use overall and harder to use correctly. So I feel like that's a, a place where they traded some amount of flexibility to make the whole overall system simpler and also make it easier for people to use. Do you think that in exposing some controls, because now you know certain environment variables tweak certain garbage collector behaviors, for example, right? Do you think the act of exposing controls can make the system intrinsically more complex or things built around it? Exposing more controls make the system... Like when there are more knobs, when there are more knobs, sorry, let me, let me ask this in the most cryptic way. Yeah. Sorry. If we expose no knobs, then certainly we can at least say it's easy. We don't know how much complexity we're hiding away. Exposing more knobs can make it harder to choose the right knobs for your case. So there we're talking about the agent, the entity that interacts with the system, right? But do you think that the act of exposing knobs makes things potentially more complicated for the system itself, for the system designer, or for other things that need other systems that need to interact with that system? I want to talk about the opposite of that, okay. right? Do you think exposing too few knobs can make it harder to use, more complicated? Yeah, right? sure. <laughs> so it seems there has to be some middle ground there. Um, so it's to me making something simple and easy is exposing the right knobs, right? Yeah. Which wouldn't we all like to do that? So, so how do we choose those right <laughs> knobs? That, that's the game, isn't it? Yeah. It, it feels like that's not quite an orthogonal relationship, but it feels like these are two loosely correlated things, right? Because I feel like in my mind, I'm like, yes, you can add knobs to something and it can make something more or less simple. And you can remove knobs from something and make it more or less simple. And that, in my mind, means that these two things are perhaps related, but not directly related, right? Because if they were if they were more directly related, then you could be like, oh, removing knobs from something, that'll make it simpler. Or removing knobs from something makes it more complex and have it always hold that way. And since it doesn't always hold, it feels like these are like, you can make something simpler by adding or removing knobs, but it depends on the thing that it is, less on the simplicity itself. That goes back to the objective subjective thing, right? Like, I mean, I think there are some objective things we could say about this, right? Like having two knobs that do the same thing is more complex, right? Well, if you have two knobs that do the same thing, that's just dumb. <laughs> I mean, like if you think of like a, a command line utility, you often have like a log name flag and a short flag and they do the same thing and they're two different knobs. I mean, they're two different phrases you use. But I think that, doesn't necessarily add complexity to a command line utility to have short and long options. But I don't know, maybe it does. Maybe I'm wrong there. But it, it doesn't feel like that. It, it like inevitably does. That's that's an interesting point. So let's let's compare if you have short and long form. That's one way of sort of duplicating 
what's being exposed. But if you have one flag, whatever, who's setting the value of that flag on the command line actually implicitly changes the value that is passed or the set of values that are acceptable to pass to another flag. Now we are talking about a more complex interaction between separate parts of the system. And that can certainly make using a tool more difficult. Like, wait, why is it behaving differently now? Or why can't I pass this value over here anymore because I pissed this value over there? And that's a bit different than, I mean, to me, what's, what's complicated about that is that we can all learn the general rule of long and short flags. This is something that, you know, I feel like is, is a sort of command line 102 type thing, right? You got double dashes and you got single dashes and yay, you know, not everybody follows that pattern. But once you learn that general rule, you have a bounding box that essentially all command line applications you interact with are going to fit into. But once you're into a space where having, you know, if you have the flag foo and a flag bar and you pass values to foo and that ends up implicitly affecting the value that is used for bar, there's no general rule that you can appeal to to understand the behavior of the system that you're interacting with. Um, you just have to tough it out. Uh, and that makes for a harder experience, but I'm not sure it actually, I'm not sure if that's revealing something about the complexity of the underlying system or if that complexity is necessary or not. Yeah. Mm. I run in circles a lot on this if you can't tell. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> I feel this is a very, uh, there's, there's a lot of semantics involved and like trying to nail down a precise meaning. Cause I feel like there's these like three separate things of like, you have like this domain of simple and complex or like simplex and complex. And then you have easy and hard. And then you have like complicated and I don't know what the opposite of complicated is, but it feels like there's these three different straightforward. I, I guess. Yeah. And I feel like often people conflate these three different domains together. And I feel like that's what makes it hard to disentangle them. And I feel like most of the time, what people want is for things to be easy and uncomplicated. And what they wind up trying to do is, or yeah, I think they want things easy and uncomplicated. And they, they think that making things simplistic will get them to that. And I think that usually the way you get toward things that wind up being easy, complex, easy, uncomplicated, and simple is actually very challenging. And it doesn't look like what people think simple looks like. So they, they go in having this conception of, oh, something that is simple, easy, and uncomplicated looks like X. And it rarely looks like it, or at least the process of producing it doesn't look like X. Yeah, so bringing this back around to actually writing software. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so is, is simplicity not the thing we should be pushing for? Is it straightforwardness? Uh, simplicity is absolutely the thing we should be pushing for. I just think we have to help people better understand what simplicity means. Because I think when people think of sim when people think of simple, they think of easy and they think of easy for them. They don't think of easy for a broader audience of people. And when they think about simple, they think about uncomplicated for them and not uncomplicated in general. So that, that's I, I tend to say that people tend to want simplicity, but what they wind up building is simplistic. So it's just it kind of looks and feels like it should be simple, but it's not. It's like inherently complicated and complex and difficult to use for for most people. But it's it's easy for them. So they think it's easy or it just like doesn't do enough, right? If you do something in a simplistic way, it's, it's kind of like I, I, I would equate it to like kind of the broader sense of like when people say like, oh, common sense solution to a problem. It's like if you actually sit down and think about the common sense solution to problems, they don't actually make much sense. Um, it's just like a nice talking point of like, oh, you can just solve this thing. And it's like, well, there's all of this nuance that you have to understand if you really want to solve this problem. And in software, it's the same thing where you, there's all of this extra nuance, all these other things that you have to take into consideration to arrive at a simple solution. And people don't really want to do that. So they go with the simplistic thing that appears to have done that without doing the work. As far as that application to software, I think it's like 
usually I think this comes up when people like those really like the, the hype cycle things when people are like, oh, just use this one thing and it'll solve your problems or just go download this library and it'll solve your problems. I think that especially in the, in the kind of dependency space, this is where it gets kind of a little overdrive where people are just like, this is a solved problem. Someone's already, someone's already fixed this. Someone's already built this thing before. Just go use the thing they've built. And it's like people have, someone has solved a similar problem to yours, but is that your problem? And if it's not, then you're going to have a solution that doesn't really work well for you and doesn't wind up being simple, winds up being simplistic, which just is not great for anybody. So this is making me think about, I, I, I mostly agree. It's uh, making me think about a, uh, you know what? I'm going to put a cap on that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to come back to that because that's this whole thing. Um, and it's more tangenty. Let me start with like a direct answer to your actual question, Ian, <laughs> which is uh, on the one hand, Yes, we should be striving for simplicity because don't artists want to make good art? And I picked those terms on purpose. The real question is how much art versus dirty machine do you need to make in the moment that you are in? It's really easy to fall down the rabbit hole of chasing simplicity and recognizing what's merited for the problem you are solving is the meta skill here. That's, that is key, I think. Yeah. It does seem like there are, there should be different standards for different things, right? Yeah. Like something meant to be consumed widely should arguably strive for more simplicity than probably. Right. And of course the difficulty is that, you know, if it, even if it's meant to be consumed widely, doesn't mean that it will be. And at what point is it mature enough and consumed widely enough that it becomes worth investing the effort. And then you have the whole pile of crap you've made up to that point to get it consumed widely enough. Yeah, I feel like that's a place because I'm going through this right now as I'm trying to like actively build a web application server. And I guess this, this is like I have an unpopular opinion about this. So I won't say too much about it. But it's like this this desire I have to actually like make this thing simple and make it understandable. And one of the things I keep coming across is I keep asking myself this question. I always thought the answer would be like never. So I, I, I asked the question like, if not now, then when? When I, when I have something I need to do, it's like, okay, I could, if I defer this thing, when am I actually going to do it? When am I actually going to clean it up? Like if I'm, if I'm going to stop chasing after simplicity and stop trying to make this thing simple, when am I going to come back and finish making it simple? And like, I guess there's a precursor question of like, do I need to make it more simple? Like, is it simple enough as it is? Is there more, is it worth the effort to make it more simple or is it good? Because if it's good, then that's cool. But I think that rarely we have that feeling of like, ah, this is simple. This is good. If we do have it, it's for a fleeting moment. And then you start seeing all of the weird seams around things. You're like, yikes. But that's the thing I come back to is always asking myself, if not, if not now, then when? Because I think that helps with what you're saying, Sam, of like, well, if you do build something and it does become popular and you're like, I'll fix it later. And then it's popular and you're at later and you have this giant pile of crap and you're like uh i gotta fix this now then it just becomes like uh, i mean that's that's where we get to i think the last episode you were on where you're just like now nah, we're just gonna greenfield it and throw the whole thing away and try again <laughs> but if you haven't tuned yourself to understand at what point you should push for simplicity i think you'll run into the same problem so i think as far as software application is concerned i feel like there is never a perfect point of simplicity, but I feel like it's one of those gut things you have to develop, that intuition thing you have to develop of being like, I have done, I've pushed this simplicity enough that we can move on to the other thing. It's not perfect. Nothing will ever be perfect. There's some edges that aren't quite as, as softened as I'd like them to be. They're still a little rough, but it works. So we can, we can move forward. So then, again, Ian, yes, we should be striving for simplicity. But how much in the moment that we're in is the question. And I agree, Chris, this is a, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, simplicity isn't a framework that you use. It isn't a number of lines of code metric and per function that you can follow. It's not reducible to something because I think when we talk about when software engineer ish folks talk about simplicity, what we're really talking about is the criteria by which we evaluate our art. And those are never going to be finished things. So from each project that you do is you make your dirty little machine, like we all do. How much can you learn? How much can you improve your craft in moving towards simplicity? 
I kind of feel like perhaps simplicity lives in that realm of like infinite things. Cause like, I think I brought this book up before, but there's a book by Simon Sinek called infinite games. And it talks about, you know, infinite games and finite games. And there's a lot of games that we play that are infinite games. Like business is an example of one, right? There's no such thing as winning a business. You either are in business and playing the game of business, or you are out of business and you are no longer playing, right? There's there, you cannot win business. You can snapshot it at a period of time. You'd be like, for this year we were winning, but there's, there's no such thing as winning business overall. And I feel like simplicity fits into that same category of things. So it's like, there's never, it's not something is never simple, right? It's a goal that we can never achieve, but it's a goal we push ourselves toward because it makes what we do better. And I think understanding that kind of helps with it. Is that like, it's not a finite thing. There's not like, a, okay, we can spend two more months and the thing will be simple and it'll be good. It'll be simple. We'll, we'll be great. It's fine. It's like, it'll be, it'll have a, a snapshot of simplicity. Sure. But there will be more things because also like, simplicity is fighting against complexity and complexity is just, you know, time adds complexity to things like things change and that makes things complex. And so you're always going to be fighting against this deluge of complexity that's trying to inject itself into your system. And so simplicity is like a, a fight that you, you have to fight forever, but you shouldn't always be fighting that fight. You know, you got to like sleep and eat and do other things. You got to build other parts of your system. You got to, you got to ship something. And ship. Yeah. Also ship. You got to ship something, right? That's like the, you know, one of the things I learned as a writer in school is like, yeah, it's your, your work is never done, but you have to publish at some point, right? It's not, it's not going to be complete. It's not going to feel complete, but at some point you got to, you got to publish it. You got to get it out there. You got to get the words out there. And, uh, I think sometimes we as, as software people just don't, we, we think that there's a point at which it will look pristine. It'll be perfect. But this is excellent. I also think as, as, a, as a side effect of this, when we do find stopping points, we as an industry don't know how to deal with that yet. Like if you go to GitHub and look for a dependency and it hasn't had a commit in two years, are you going to use that dependency? Like, <laughs> even if it, it's good, it's fine. It's working. There's, there's no bugs with it. It's not going to be a problem for you. We have this discomfort with using things that haven't been touched in a while. It's like, I don't know. There's, there's been no commits. It looks like it's abandoned. And it's like, maybe that reached a level of simplicity where it's just, it's, it's fine how it is. It doesn't, it doesn't need anything more. It's, it's working. It's good. It's fine. But we have a, an apprehension to that idea, I think. I think that is in conflict with simplicity, right? Because that means we don't we don't ever leave things alone. We keep wanting to touch things, and every time every time you touch something, you have a risk of breaking that simplicity of making the thing more complicated and complex. And software is the art of adding bugs to an empty file, right? <laughs> <laughs> This is a changelog news break. Hugging Face released a distilled variant of Whisper for speech recognition. It's English only and optimized to the hilt, which resulted in running six times faster while being 49% smaller and performing within 1% word error rate from the original model. It's designed to be a drop-in replacement and the Hugging Face team cites five reasons why you might use it. Faster inference, robustness to noise, robustness to hallucinations, designed for speculative decoding, and permissively MIT licensed. This looks great, but I'm still waiting on speaker diarization. You just heard one of our five top stories from Monday's Changelog News. Subscribe to the podcast to get all of the week's top stories and pop your email address in at changelog.com slash news to also receive our free companion email with even more developer news worth your attention. Once again, that's changelog.com slash news. So Chris, earlier you, you mentioned this, this game of simplicity is almost an intuition, right? Can you think of examples of things that make things simpler or less simple? Like for, I can give you an example too, if you, I mean, for go, one of the things that comes to mind about it's a, it's a weird thing, but the way that we lay out files in Go, like the actual code in a file feels like something that has this property of like, there's a, there's a balance. It's like, how many types do you put in a file? 
How do you arrange them? And at some point, it feels like, okay, this file is getting too complex. There's too many things in it. I need to split this thing out into other files. And then there's a point at which, okay, this package is too complex. I need to split this thing into other packages. So I think just like the way we structure code is a good example of this simplicity and trying to find a good good balance in there. I agree. And I think, and like, I want to be clear too, because I, I was I was ragging on like number of lines per function earlier, but these criteria aren't wrong. But like when we talk about package organization, when we talk about number of methods on a type class, if we're not in Go, we are talking about aspects of the system where grappling with the questions about how you organize the code, how many properties it should have, how you split it up, how you distribute your responsibility. Like that's the way that you exercise and build your intuition about making something simple. And it's the sort of visible ways that uh, sort of obvious surface visible ways that we end up expressing simplicity in the software that we create, but it is not itself the simplicity. That's the sort of hidden variable behind all of it. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess what you're saying is that like we need these, these heuristics we have are inherently useful heuristics, but you can't like, if we were to say like 50 lines of code is the, the largest of functions to ever be, making every single function in your code base 50 lines of code will not make it simple. Right. None of them are useful or correct in isolation. All of them are contextual and dependent. Learning how to contextualize the different metrics is it's the game. That's the thing you were learning to build your, your skills. There's a thing here. I want to I wanna jump back to Rich Hickey for a second, if we could, because I realized, actually, I think maybe just in, in the lead up to talking about this and this, this topic, that I think I might hear the name of that talk, Simple Made Easy, differently than most other people do. I think the conventional interpretation of it might be, follows the idiom that is common in in English, right? Like, I don't know, gardening made easy or uh, flapjacks made easy, uh, whatever, you know, task made easy. But I don't think that's what it means. I think what's interesting about that talk, and I think it's interesting here, and Chris, you just made the sound like I think you see what I'm going for. But I think what's interesting about the way that the title of that talk is constructed and the whole argument made in it, and part of what we're circling around here, is that indeed, to have a system and, and our software artifact of some kind that is intrinsically simple, it has nice orthogonal pieces, it has clearly defined bounds of responsibility, you can reason about and predict its behavior, it composes well with other things, does not in any way guarantee that it's going to be easy. You might need to have, you know, simply enough, like interacting with it might require 10 lines of code instead of the ideal one. So that talk is really about that verb made. How do you take something that has the intrinsic properties of being simple? So we're just kind of assuming that those exist and are definable and make it into something that is easy. How do you span that gap? And I do think that's a useful way of, of thinking about this because as we think about trying to put simplicity in our software, I, I think a lot of what we're thinking about is how well do I understand the problem that I'm trying to solve? How well have I translated that into the software that I've made? And how crisp, orthogonal, elegant does it feel to me? And to what extent have I feel like, do I feel like this is just now something that's solved? Like whatever I was setting out to do, it's done. There's that whole process. And that is almost entirely separate from how easy the interface is to using that thing. You can go through this whole process of sorting out, you know, this problem you're trying to solve, its relation to the logical or physical world, whatever, and still have a god awful, absolutely not usable, absolutely not easy interface. And yeah, so part of the reason that, in addition to the fact that sometimes it's just not worth it for what you're doing to spend a whole bunch of time trying to find that kernel of a simple system for the problem you're working on, these are really, to me, kind of well, they're not they're not totally separate, but semi-separate things, right? How do I understand the system that I'm trying to, the thing that I'm trying to do well enough and it's interrelated parts and tidy it up. It's internals and then how do I build the, the, the surface on top of that? Right. So I have, I have two things on that. I think the first is like, oh, was 
maybe I haven't always, but for a very long time, I've always read the simple made easy as like, how do you make simple into something easy? I didn't realize there was that other interpretation of like the, oh, this thing made easy. Like, oh, we can just, this is how you do simplicity in an easy way, not how do you transform yeah. simplicity into something that's easy. What's weird is I think most people probably have the same interpretation, but the way that it gets talked about ends up mostly being the other one. That like, oh, it's easy to do simplicity. This is sort of the way that you think about it. But ba ba now you've made a simple system. No. <laughs> Sorry, go, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I guess the second thing, like the thing that kind of popped in my head is that it sounds like a, a divide between kind of what we traditionally think of as like, the, the software building process and the product management process. And then like on the simple side, you have like, okay, we're trying to make the software, like we're, we're focusing on the software itself. Whereas like kind of the focus of product management largely is like the users of the thing and how will they be able to interact with this thing and making it, I mean, I feel like most project managers would say, yeah, I want my product to be easy for the user, whoever that user is or whatever set of users I have, like that's their, that's their goal. So I feel like in a way, it's kind of marrying these two things together of being like, yes, we understand a lot of the heuristics of how to build simple software, but now we also need to use the heuristics of how to build easy software and then bring those two things together, which is the, the, the challenging part, right? Because a lot of things that make software simple make it harder to use, I think, as you kind of brought yeah. up there. It's often for buffs. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think like the the this is what we got to get from like the I think I think type systems are a good example of this where people are really like no 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 you have to have a static type system like this makes the <laughs> system like simpler because everything is known but it's like sure but does it does it make the system easier like does it make the language easier for people to use I think that's like kind of the big debate happening in, in TypeScript land of people <laughs> being like and DHH is going to swoop in and sprinkle some middle fingers all over that perspective. Yeah. 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 He's just kind of like, <laughs> oh, no, like type, like people are like types. You have to have types to make things simple. You have to. I think that's a, a, a good example of perspective as well in position. Like the thing I dislike about the, the whole ideology around like static typing is required and necessary is like we've been building humongous applications in JavaScript for decades. Like we've been building things in Erlang and in Lisp and in PHP and all of these languages that are dynamically typed. And we built amazing systems. Like the web still runs on PHP, right? It's still a whole bunch of WordPress and Drupal and all of that stuff out there. And it works very well. And there aren't any there's not static typing and everything's okay. And it's like, yes, in some contexts, static typing does make things simpler, but in other contexts, it makes things more complex or in some contexts, it makes things you want to build like impossible because of weird. And I think that's how we wind up with most of the language we have being hybrid. Like Go is statically typed, but it's also dynamically typed, right? We can do reflection. We can use empty interface or any, we can use all of this stuff that like scoots around the type system when we need to. And I feel like that's another place where it's like the balance of like, well, who are your users and what are your users expecting? If your users are expecting a statically typed thing and you give them a dynamic type language, it's going to be very hard for them to use regardless of how simple the language is. And the inverse is true as well. If you hand a statically typed language to someone that's expecting a dynamically typed language, it's going to be hard for them to use regardless of like the simplicity of the language itself. Like I think this is one of the tough things about learning Rust is that it's like, no, 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 Rust is a very elegant system, but it expects you to be a very specific type of human. And if you're not that type of human and you don't want to become that type of human, Rust is probably not going to be the language for you. No hate on these programming languages. I think they're all they're all wonderful. They're all beautiful. They're all useful for things. Clearly, none of them are as good as Go because this is Go time. However, <laughs> I don't know, talking through this all, I'm starting to realize like simplicity is not gonna like it, it just can't always happen, right? There's always gonna be complexity. So the choices we're making is where to put the simplicity, right? Like where does it belong? Where does it? Yeah, you you cannot eliminate complexity, right? You can't get rid of all of the complexity. I, I suppose maybe if you build absolutely nothing, you can get rid of all the complexity because then you have nothing and nothing is pretty simple. <laughs> but if you if you build something, you have complexity and you inherently have more complexity over time. So it's always this battle of really reducing the amount of complexity down to a level that we call simplicity, right? I feel I feel like that's kind of the thing of like, I don't really know if it's either a scale of complexity or a scale of simplicity. And it's like one end is like 
enough where we would say that thing is now simple or that thing is now complex. But I don't think they're kind of like like static things where it's just like there are simple things, there are complex things, and that it. That's it. It's not a binary. It's like a it's like a scale of some sort. And there's you know there's a there's a point at which we're like okay that thing's not simple anymore. But we don't really know where that point is. We don't really know where those things exist. I feel like it's kind of like temperature where it's like, I don't know, is it hot out? I'm like, I don't know. It depends on who you are and where you are and what you consider hot to be. I feel like that's the same with like, is it simple? There's a lot of subjectivity that goes into whether something is simple or not. It's a different subjectivity than the easy hard, but it is a subjectivity in and of itself. I think that's the thing from No Silver Bullet from come up on 40 years ago. Uh, the No Silver Bullet paper, essential versus accidental complexity. What? is necessary to the problem you're trying to solve. What is an extraneous result of frameworks have used, misunderstandings of the problem you were trying to solve, bad scopings, boundaries, et cetera. And then, yeah, how worth it is it to try to actually chase the essential complexity of any given problem? Which does suggest something practical, right? Like, and, and it's, not, it's not groundbreaking, but understand your problem first, understand your users, make a reasonable guess based on what you know right now about what you think both the sort of essential nature of the problem you need to solve is and what aspects of that are most likely to change. Do not get sucked into the rabbit hole because you cannot predict the future and don't try. And then, you know, make an estimation about the quickest and dirtiest way that you can roughly approximate what you think that essential part of the problem is that will fit inside of the time you have to solve it in times two, because give yourself some buffer because nobody can estimate. <laughs> it's not a hard problem. And then go and, and, and make a thing and get in a feedback loop, work through all of the different things we've talked about. Like you look at the number of lines, code, try to organize things in a way that makes some sort of sense in your head, work on your instincts about uh, why you would organize things together, keep a notebook about why you chose to, you know, organize the things in the way you have or put it in the documentation, come back and check those assumptions later. As long as you take the outlook that achieving simplicity is an art and not like a form of measurable engineering, I think it's a lot easier because then you accept that it's something you're going to work on and improve and hone your craft and not, you know, this end outcome that has to be like hit in every case. I feel like there's, there's this interesting, I don't know what it was you said, but something you said uh, kind of reminded me that there's this, a simplicity is a function, is a part of the design of the thing. And I think that we think it's a part of the building process of the thing. Yeah. Right. And it's, cause I've, been, I've been thinking a lot about engineering and how engineering is Really, I think this doesn't get brought up enough when we talk about this, like, is software engineering engineering discussion? Is that engineering is a field of, uh, is a subfield of design. Like, what engineers do is they design things. They don't, they don't build things. And I think the fact that we in software forget that means that we expect both the thing that we are designing to wind up being simple and we expect the way that we build it to be simple. And I yeah. think that, the, the process of building the thing will almost never be simple. It's always going to be pretty messy and kind of just pretty like the, as you were saying that like dirty machine that you're building, right? Like I've been watching a building be constructed and like one of my friends is a civil engineer and I keep like pinging him with questions being like, Hey, why are they doing this thing this way? Why are you doing this thing that way? And like most of the time his response is, I have no idea because I don't know how building, I don't like I design buildings for their final state. I design for the thing that's going to be at the end. Yeah. How that thing gets built is up to the construction people and the construction people use all sorts of like weird tactics to like actually build things and actually put all the things together. And it looks like chaos. And then eventually it just comes out and it's like this beautiful thing. Like for a very long time, I always wondered like, how do they actually build a skyscraper that is just concrete, right? Concrete floors with pillars. Like, how do they how do they get the concrete into the in up there? And I was like, oh, they have concrete pumps. I'm like, well, where where does the floor come from? And it's like, oh, well, they just take a bunch of metal poles and a bunch of like wood and some plywood, or maybe something a little better than plywood. It's probably something else, but and they just build a floor of wood out of it, and then they pour concrete on top of it, and the concrete then cures. 
and it just holds itself up with like support columns and all of that. And then they take away all of the wood and all the poles and all of that. And I'm like, oh, so they just kind of like build a fake structure to build the thing. And then they take that fake structure away. And I don't feel like we do things like that in software. I feel like we just try and jump right to the, what is the final thing? Let's go build that right now. When there's like, maybe there's this intermediate step where we have to build something that we're going to throw away, but we never really want to throw things away. So we never really want to do that step. And so we come up with really weird Rube Goldberg machines for like how we actually manage to like, you know, pour a concrete floor, right? It's like, oh, we don't want to build the structural tear down. We don't want to build scaffolding as much as we love that word. We don't want to actually build it because that feels like a waste. So we're going to find some other way to like lift slabs of concrete in the air or something and make this work. And it's like, there's a simpler way, but you have to embrace the fact that it's going to be like complex and messy. Or I guess there's an easier way, but you're going to embrace that it's going to be complex and messy and you will still get to the nice thing at the end the beautiful building that you want to have, but the actual process of constructing that's going to be a bit gross. And I feel like we as software engineers, we want the entire process to look beautiful. We want the entire process to be simple and easy and straightforward. And I think our avoidance of that is what often leads to just like the absolute messes that we wind up with. I mean, I'm mostly with you, except I want to go back and say like, maybe you don't get to that end structure. Maybe you do F it up. (laughs) <laughs> and and maybe you were right all along that the messy stuff that you were doing along the way was too messy and it keeps you from getting to the end. Like, that's a real possibility. There's nuance. Like, I think it's uh, there's that one saying that people have when they talk about other fields of engineering and they're like, well, you like, you know, bridge builders, they never have to move bridges. It's like, ah, there's entire books about how to move bridges if you built them in the wrong place or you built them incorrectly. Like, this is the thing that happens and we have to, like, deal with. So it's like, yeah. Sometimes like the the messy part is like, no, there's something wrong here and we need to to go back and fix it. But that's also why, like, you know, you need to have engineers and designers in the process. It's not like they give you a design and then they just walk away and go do something else. It's like, no, they're involved in the entire construction. If they don't understand the construction process, they're involved in it. Um, Same thing with a lot of fields, like the same thing with like television production, where like the writers are usually involved in the entire process, like they're on set, they're like rewriting parts of the script that don't make sense when they're actually trying to film the show. But in software, I feel like a lot of the times, like our designers, for as much as we have them, kind of don't touch the actual building process. They've come with this elegant design, they handed us some team, and then that team builds the thing. Or we try and make designers that also build the thing themselves. There's not like a very good like separation between like, hey, you've designed the thing. You're not actually building it, but you're intimately involved with the people that are. I feel like I feel like that line is not one we figured out how to how to how to navigate very well. There are people in every company I've been in that do this, but it's not like a thing we can train people to do. It's not like a thing that's written down. It's just like, hey, we have a good like staff or senior staff or principal engineer that does that thing. But you also usually have a pile of people who are very bad and don't do that thing. <laughs> and it's, it's like, okay, well, we need to, to, to figure this out as an industry. Sorry, that was just a tangent I went on. I went somewhere. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you said something earlier before that little rant. That simplicity is in the design, not maybe not in the implementation, right? Not not in the implementation, in the building process specifically. Yeah, well, yeah, okay, that <laughs> feels similar, but I don't know that that feels important. Yeah, like I, I feel like I think it goes back to what Sam said earlier, like avoiding non-essential complexity, right? So if you if you design your system in the simplest way possible, avoiding complexity without. That's not this. I don't know. I feel like I'm just rambling here, but I don't know what I'm getting at is it feels like the design process and thinking through it up front can o- almost automatically lead to simpler software. Right. Yeah. I mean, that that's, I, w- I wouldn't even necessarily call it the design process. It's like requirements gathering. What problem are we trying to solve? And then what problems, other problems sit enmeshed in, which tends to find the problem we're trying to solve. But, you know, as a, especially if you are, you know, a, a relatively, relatively new software engineer, like trying to figure out how to grow. And you've somehow made it this far into this episode of people talking about hand waving complexity things. Then the only part of this that I think you can really think your way through real super hard and have it actually be useful is the part where you try to understand the problem. 
really well. What is the actual problem that needs solving? Who needs to solve it, dare I say, because the humans do matter? Why they need to solve it? What are they really trying to do? Because the better a grasp you have on that, the more fixed a sense of what might be essential and might be accidental are come after that. And those are the things that really like affect stuff. So spend your cogitating time on that and then pick a framework for if you're doing HTTP things, pick a decent popular one. I don't know if, if I were to give like pick things off the shelf, right? You know, limit your service. Aid. Don't try to make everything perfect, but try to learn about how other people have designed things in ways that feel simple and try to make that distinction between things that sort of are maybe just easy to get started versus things that actually end up feeling simple all the time. Take notes, write down your hypotheses. The things that I tend to look for are indeed like, if I feel like the documentation is reasonably broken down so that here we can talk about one concept over there and one concept over there and the controls for them are relatively separate, the function calls, the exposed types, whatever it is, that tends to be indicative of it. But like form your hypothesis about whether the thing that you're considering using is simple or just easy and grab it, try it out in the context of your problem. See if it seemed right or not. You cannot think your way through implementation. You can think your way through understanding of the problem. So understand the problem very fast. Just get in a feedback loop. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I definitely agree with, with that. I think the place where I, because once again, I'm like literally trying to go through this right now and like, I want to build a web application server. And I think the thing that I keep coming across is even in the process of trying to design something simple, the hard part is like actually knowing things, right? Like I feel like the, <laughs> like understanding how, like e like even just HTTP is like mind bogglingly complex when you want to sit down and actually learn how the thing works. Like an example of like what I'm going through right now is I'm just kind of like, what does modern day SEO look like? Like wh what does Google care about? What does DuckDuckGo care about? What do all these web search crawlers care about? How should you represent just the HTML of your page? What tags should you have in the head? And it's like, where do you, like you have to sit down and think about those things and think about whether you care about them. But in order to know if you should care about them, you have to know what they are. So I feel like there's this other precursor part of like, a very useful part of designing things is acquiring knowledge that you can use later. Like I think kind of what you've been saying all along, Sam, is like you need to have these like feedback cycles of like state your hypothesis, then go do something, then come back to it and see how right you were. Because that's that's the process of learning is seeing yourself grow and feeling that and making yourself be able to move forward. And I feel like people often rush to like go grab stuff off the shelf and be like, I just need to build something. And it's extremely challenging to resist that temptation but resisting that temptation, I think, is what leads to you being able to design and build things that are simple. Because fundamentally, you have to know how things work if you want to build something simple, if you want to design something simple. If you don't understand how the things work, you have a very low chance of designing or building something simple. And I feel like as an industry, we have pushed ourselves very far away from that. And I feel like Go as a language is a very good language to do this in because there are so many of those like basic pieces in the standard library, like building an HTTP server is a good example. Like you can just take the HTTP library and then build what you need with it, but it gives you very little. So you have to understand all of the stuff you need to build on top of it. And sure, maybe the stuff you build on top of it isn't what you put into production because it will not give you the levels of, you know, scalability or whatever that you need and you need to pull something off the shelf. But by actually building the thing yourself and acquiring the knowledge, now you know what you need to go, you know, acquire what the right, the right off the shelf thing is. Because if you don't understand it and there's this whole sea of options in front of you, maybe you'll pick the one that actually solves your problem, but you're probably not going to pick the right thing that solves your problem. So I think, yeah, so I guess the, the kernel of that is like when you're in the design process, go do the heart, like go build the stuff yourself. Don't necessarily put that in production. Don't necessarily go build, don't implement it with that stuff, but at least make sure that you understand how the thing that you're trying to build works to a low enough level that you're, you know, you can actually make this sim simple. Because if you don't, then you're, you're going to have complexity that you're not dealing with and it's going to break through whatever abstraction or interface that you've, you've created. Yeah, makes sense.
I'm supposed to be saying unpopular things. You're supposed to <laughs> push back, be like, no, Chris, that makes no sense. You should just go pull I mean, stuff off the shelf. <laughs> I, I, I agree with you. I'm not sure what you're saying is entirely practical, but I, I, I think while it might not be practical, it's important to do some impractical things in your career and, and learn from them, right? Like doing that impractical thing now will gain for later, right? Yeah, it's Once again, it's part of the infinite game, right? It's part of this like... We'll never have simple software. That's not a thing that will will exist. We'll have software that is more simple or or like, you know, more better than it was before. And the same idea, you know, like the United States has the whole thing in the Declaration of Independence that's like, all men are created equal and all of that. And that's just like a, a vision for the future. Like, will we ever get there? I don't know. How practical is that to actually do that? It's like, that's a very challenging and fraught proposition to push forward and we're going to get it wrong a lot of the time but we should still always be aiming aiming to do that and i think the same thing applies to like software design where it's like we should always be aiming to acquire more knowledge for ourselves and build something that's simpler and there's there's limits right you once as you said in the beginning of episode sam you can't go down the simplicity rabbit hole forever but i think it's important that people understand that you should be going down that rabbit hole a little bit each time you design something, learning something a little bit more, understanding how things work a little bit more. For practicality reasons, sometimes you won't be able to do that. But I feel like the place where we wound up in Go and in most places in software is that we just don't do it. Like the number of times I had to fight with people to just get them to do really basic design, to just understand how something at a very simple level works or go dig in a little bit more to a problem instead of just saying, eh, I think I think it's all good. It's it's just, it's been too much. Like I've had to push too much to get people to do these things. It's like, no, keep pulling that thread, right? Keep pull- It might unravel the sweater, but better it unravel now than it unravel when it's in production, right? Like we, <laughs> you, you don't want to unravel the the whole sweater when you're, you know, have terabytes of data and you're serving th- tens of thousands of customers or whatever. Do it when you have no customers, when you have nothing and, and make sure that, you know, it's not going to just fall apart when you don't have the resources or time to fix it. And that's a difficult balance to make. It's not something you can predict. It's an un- the future, as I said, on, I think two episodes ago, is an unknowable unknown. You cannot know what will happen in the future. But we can get pretty good at predicting what might happen. Um, and I think at this point, we need to start predicting, like, it, people, we need a better path for people learning about this stuff, about simplicity, about how to do simplicity. And it does require that we just sit down and do the work. So I can't... I, 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 it can't be to some level that's like, oh, no, like only do this if you have time. It's like, no, make the time, but balance that with everything else. And yes, sometimes you can skip. It's like working out. Like you have to work out each and every, not every day, but like you have to have a schedule <laughs> and you do it. And sometimes you can skip. Sometimes you can cheat, but you can't cheat all of the time because then you won't be getting the thing that you want. And I feel like software design and simplicity is that as well. Like you have to fight for it. It's not going to be something that right now, at least your organization or your coworkers or whoever is likely to be completely on board with. So you have to balance it, but you need to start introducing it and start having people see the benefits of it and start once again, tracking the, well, what do we think it would take and how is it actually? And start building up that evidence to do it. Because that's how I think we actually, as a whole, get ourselves towards simple software and towards simplicity is by taking these tiny steps. So make sure that, you know, as small as it is, you're doing something on every project. You're doing some design. You're pushing back a little bit. Don't risk your job, obviously, but. Or do. Or do. Or, I mean, (laughs) Sam, we're going to get into unpopular opinions soon. I mean, I have. (laughs) On that note. I, I do, we've done a lot of talking, we've done a lot of kind of debating back and forth. I'd love if, if we could each just take a key point out of what we said and just like, what like one heuristic you can follow on a project to make your software simpler. Just like a recap. I would say, <laughs> this is going to sound very typical for me, but document and comments what you're doing. Like, I think if there's one thing that has helped me write simpler software especially simpler go is actually having to write out in prose what the thing i'm trying to do is doing and i often have realized that i'm not building that thing 
and that there's some more thinking I have to do. So actually sitting down and writing the comments, even though you're like, I know how this thing works. I understand how it works. I don't need to. It's like, just do it anyway. Write the comment and make sure that you what you think you are building is actually what you're building. What about you, Sam? Can I expand to, to two and a half as long as they're tight? Is that all right? <laughs> go for it. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, go for it. I, it's reiterating what I said, but spend your thinking time understanding requirements. Spend your writing time getting in a feedback loop and in a scientific mindset, testing out those things that people say about what makes software simple and seeing if it feels like it applies inside of your feedback loop. I feel like I should throw that nice Richard Feynman quote in there that that science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. That feels like it, it fits there as well. I mean, how else are you going to get to the point of having an unpopular opinion? <laughs> <laughs> Ian, what about you? What, what advice? I, I think mine, my biggest one would just be choose where to put the simplicity. Like, like be, be thoughtful about where that simplicity goes. Like, whether it be at the edges or uh, I think it probably should be at the edges, right? But yeah, be thoughtful about where the simplicity goes. Like, does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I have a funny thing here is the thing that I put a pin in earlier, which I don't know, you can cut the whole thing later if it, if it doesn't work. How about that? <laughs> but I've been staring at this chart, which is in uh, a YouTube video called you can't get snakes from chicken eggs, which is from one of my favorite, like anti alt right YouTubers. And he's talking about in the case of you can't get snakes from chicken eggs, how, you know, arguments about evolution often go for those who do not believe in evolution. They will come up with these super simple, tight little statements like you can't get snakes from chicken eggs. And that's like tiny, right? It's a, it's a pithy little sense. And the explanation about how you get snakes from chicken eggs or whatever um, is actually a much longer, thicker explanation uh, about, you know, intergenerational mutation and selection pressures and blah, 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 blah. But the chart that he puts up, well, the chart that he puts up is, is the notion that accuracy decreases as we try to make something more pithy, easier, shall we say. He uses the word simple, but I think what he's actually saying conforms more to easy. It is easy to understand. You can't get snakes and chicken eggs. It feels right. But there's a truth floor. There's no limit to how simple an idea can be when it doesn't have to conform to reality. There's no limit to the amount you can do in a single line of code when you don't have to think about like larger implications or consequences or whatever. How much you reduce the complexity of that interface to the point where it's super easy to do. What I like about his construction of this, you got side by side charts, which are like accuracy on one axis and sort of ease on the other, is if you don't care about conforming to reality, about sort of dealing with the implications of making a super easy interface and you can crank that thing all the way down. Best of all, you can train an AI to just like do that thing just by firing text at it. And, you know, look how well it performed on that one little bit of text that you sent it for this particular task. If you do want to care about the conformance of the underlying system to the reality of the problem you're trying to solve, well, it's an awful lot harder. You have to deal with fundamental limits. You have to deal with the implications of trying to design a system to actually take care of that reality. You don't have to pick one or the other all the time. And like I said, or you put the simplicity, right? But to me, this is the difference between caring about whether or not you have an accurate understanding of how you get snakes from chicken eggs or how evolution fundamentally works, right? Versus having a pithy explanation that feels nice in the moment is analogous to the difference between did I fundamentally understand the problem correctly, model it correctly in, the, in the, the programming language that I'm working in, cut out all unnecessary pieces, do it in the fastest, most performant, or most efficient rather way possible, performant is not a word, and then put the sort of easiest interface on top of that that I reasonably could versus did I slap together a thing that like solves the one use case that the people with power care about seeing salt. 
I feel like there's this um so the thing I thought when you when you kind of said the truth floor there. So I feel like that's the point at which simplicity turns into simplistic or something that's simple turns into something simplistic. If you bust through it. Yeah, if you go through it. Because I think that's like, and that is also where I think what I mentioned earlier about common sense, that's where those types of things live, where it's just like you have reduced the problem down to something that is wholly impractical. So you can't can't just solve it. And I, I think there, there's there's a little bit of irony in some of these things as well, because I think some of the pithy things would part at least partially solve the problem. Like I think for like homelessness is like the example that comes to my mind. It's like, just give people homes. And it's like, actually turns out that could probably fix a big chunk of the problem. <laughs> or it's just like, I don't know, maybe just giving people money will in fact make the economy run better. So people are like, it can't possibly work. And then you give people money and then all of a sudden the economy does well. And turns out the problem with being poor is just, you don't have money. Holy crap. Sometimes a simple, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it's like, okay, well, that's, that's a nice pithy, simple thing. And then you have these other things, these other pithy things that are just like, no, that's simplistic. That just, that you have to disconnect from the the basis of reality in such a way that you can't actually do that thing. And I think we as a, as a definitely as an industry, and maybe part of the reason why society is like this is because of, software people doing things thinking the world is much more simplistic and thinking the world is simplistic and simplistic things will work of like it's very difficult for people to differentiate between those two categories of things of like the pithy things that are simple and the pithy things that are simplistic and i feel like there's a lot of thought in software engineering and in tech about just we can solve things in very simplistic ways it's just like i mean a lot of the takes on transportation i feel like fall into this bucket of just like make the cars drive themselves. That'll solve the problem. And it's kind of like, I'm, <laughs> do you understand how actually challenging that would be? Like we can barely get elevators to drive themselves and trains to drive themselves. Like now you're talking about this and it's like, yeah, it sounds like a nice easy thing or the same thing with like the, the large language model explosion where everybody's like, this is going to take over everything. And it's just like, well, not, not quite. It's a, Oh, it will. I think it will. But yes, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Sam. Uh, it's like, oh, it's going to take over. It's like, well, I mean, it, it it does well at some things, but it's like, it's a very nuanced thing. You have to like understand a lot about how this thing is working to understand like where it's applicable and where it's working. But I also think it's like sometimes those simplistic things like wind up, like the fears around them wind up being things that already exist, right? Like I think, uh, with AI is a good one where people are like, AI is going to take over the world. It's going to make life terrible. And I'm like, uh, it, it already has. We've been using algorithms for a very long time and it's made a lot of things very bad. We're here. So let's solve this problem. And a whole bunch of people are like, well, no, no, no. Now that we have chat GPT, that's what's going to make everything bad with AI. And it's like, no, no, no. We're, we're already in a place where it's bad. Let's come up with technological solutions to to fix this problem. But I think that kind of breaking through the the truth floor and getting to that simplistic common sense thing is like, well, no, no, no. The way that AI would take over things in a common sense perspective is like through something that can talk to us as at, at a language level and we'll just be super smart. Like we can see it now. So that's going to be the problem. And I feel like the roots of a lot of that stuff live in the software world where we're just like, so many times I've heard the like, I'm really going to keep saying it, like the it's a solved problem thing of like, stop trying to build this thing. It's a solved problem. We already know how to, we already have a solution. I'm like, if it's a solved problem, like definitionally, it's not a problem anymore. So we don't have to do anything. So like, if we have a problem, it's clearly not solved. So someone might have solved a similar problem, but they haven't solved this problem. So we have to actually add that nuance back to figure out what are the things that have been solved and what are the things that haven't been solved and come up with a solution that works for us. But yeah, I feel like that truth floor, I don't calling it a truth floor is weird, but like that simplicity floor, I think is something to be very mindful of in building software of that. If you do break through that floor and you wind up in the land of simplistic solutions, you will make the software you build will not be simple. It'll likely be very complex and very confusing and very complicated and hard for your users to use. If it needs to flex in ways that that you didn't anticipate when you broke. Or even if it needs to flex in ways you did anticipate, like it can still, it's just, just be very mindful of that floor that exists. We can add that to our list of heuristics. 
Build simple software, not simplistic software. Oh God, that sounds like a troll. <laughs> it just like assumes the whole thing. Developing your intuition, Chris, what you're saying. Can can I tell if this thing is simple or not? Like that this that's the whole problem here. Yeah. Right? Like it's all aspirational. How can I tell if this thing is simple or not? How can I tell if it's all the right problem or not? I do have one bit of good news, though. One bit, which is at least when it comes to those transportation things that people are trying to solve, there is a good heuristic to tell if it's BS or not. And if they mention pods anywhere, <laughs> anywhere in their promotional materials, no, it's it's a bad idea. And you should build a train instead. The car obsession. <laughs> it's like, how can we sneak a car into this thing? It's like, how can we how can we take a thing that works well? How can we take the train and turn it into a bunch of cars? Like the, the Tesla track in Vegas. Uh, that one. Yes, that's a that's a good example. There's also a bunch of other ones. There's another wonderful YouTuber on this. I'm completely stealing his his thing by saying you should have just made a train. I think that's Adam something. There's a bunch of them. Yes. That, yeah. Because I think he's the one that also was making fun of the, the Tesla truck where I mean, maybe I was, maybe I was just talking to someone, but I was just like, well, like what happens if you like someone just. AI pulls over the truck and just takes all the stuff. I was like, oh, well, you have someone in the front that's driving it. And then a bunch of AI trucks following behind that truck. And I was like, so a train. So a train. That's a. It's, <laughs> I mean, like he has he has more than a million subscribers and built a whole lot of it out of just you should have made a train. Like that's a train. That's a bad train that you're describing right now. <laughs> you took the good ideas from a train, did a cute 3D render and then like rub some technology on it. And no, it's a bad idea. Just make a train. Yeah. Stop what you're doing. Yeah. It's, Ugh. and it's, but it's, it's funny though, because this is like the way that those often work is indeed, like, wouldn't it be easy if we just took this like one thing that works super well um, and that we can tell a slick story about and then like made a system out of it that scales to millions of people will be inside of a city and actually, and it doesn't, of course. But you tell this crappy but slick, easy sounding story. And it disregards the fundamental complexities of the underlying system. I, it does feel like that's what a lot of software is. Like, especially like once again, dependencies. So I think dependencies are what tends to make software a little bit more complex than it needs to be. I feel like there's this vision of dependencies of like, oh yeah, you can just bring this one library in and it'll solve this problem. And then it just you just like hit up against reality and it's like, oh, oh no, this is not this is not gonna work the way I thought it was gonna work. I mean, we're getting we're getting so close to my unpopular opinion, though. Just like it's just like. All right, let's do some unpopular opinions. I actually think you should probably leave. All right, who wants to go first? Chris, you've been itching, itching at it the whole time. Okay, okay, I will, I will go first. I guess the, the premise of this is I've been reading this book called Recoding America. It's a fantastic book. It's by it's one that works in like the Obama White House, um, like in the, within the CTO office. Basically, the premise of the book, the whole, the, the kind of point of the book is that government has become very good at procuring technology, very bad at building technology. And I think that we as a software engineer, we as software engineers have essentially done the same things to ourselves where we've become very good at procuring software in the sense of like finding dependencies and finding things that do the thing we want and then kind of smashing them together into the larger thing that we want. And we've become pretty bad at just building the thing that we need and using some of the stuff, some of the dependencies. I think we've become like too too dependency heavy. And I think we should nope out of that and go back to being builders because I think we are absolutely terrible at procurement. So yeah, that's it. Like we are spending too much time trying to buy, not necessarily with money, but buy our software. And we are very bad at doing assessment around how to buy software. And we should just be focusing on building it instead. Even if that means sometimes you are reinventing the wheel. Yeah, because I think if, if you really sit down and you think about what it takes to properly procure any type of thing in a business, right? Like 
if you even mention Koopa to software engineers, if they know what it is, they likely have this fear that gets struck into them of like, I don't want to have to do vendor management and vendor risk analysis. But it's like, if you, you know, if software is at the core of your business, then that supply chain of software should be validated. Like every dependency you have, and likely some degree of the dependencies of your dependencies, you should have vendor records around it. You should have risk management done around it. You should have assessments done to see if it's going to be a viable, useful thing into the future. There's a lot of extra work we should be doing to secure the supply chain for our organizations. And we just do not do it. We just go pull some random crap off GitHub and be like, here, we'll use this now. And that is being very bad at doing procurement because half the job of procurement is making sure that like the thing you've procured is actually proper and fit for what you're trying to use it for. But I think on the other side, because we've been so focused on this whole like proudly found elsewhere methodology, some communities definitely more excessive than others. We've also sort of forgotten how to build stuff ourselves, or at least we have an ethos now that like building stuff yourself is seen as like dirty or you're doing it wrong or you're just trying to play around instead of being serious. It's like, oh, why are you implementing that yourself? There's, there's, a, there's a library that does it. You should just use this library instead. And I think that's just that's just really bad. And once again, like I've been I've been coming up against this as I'm trying to actively build my own stuff or at least build something without other people around to help me. It's been a lot of like me sitting down and having to ask myself over and over and over again of like, am I trading a building problem, like a software construction problem with a procurement problem? Because what I want to be good at is building software. I don't really care that much about procuring software and that side of things. And I think that we don't, as an industry, take it seriously enough to understand if we really want to be procurement specialists, we should actually go become good at procurement. I also don't think most software engineers would like that proposition at all. If you're like, you can continue using open source software and dependencies, but for every single one, you must go to this awful software called Koopa. You must enter all of the vendor information. You must perform a large risk assessment that includes like, you know, conflict of interest resolution and all of that. And then you must also like periodically review that vendor to make sure they're doing things properly. Uh, and then you must also review all of the source code to make sure that it is up to snuff and make sure to do all the proper licensing checks and all of this stuff. I think if that was, if we put that requirement in, which should be the requirement, there would be a very large drop in the usage of most open source software. There'd be vendors that you go to to get specific open source software and they would have all of the things in place to make it so that you could trust them and you can do vendor management with just them and then they do the rest of it. But it would, I think it would fundamentally change the way that we do open source and perhaps, just perhaps, make it economically sustainable to have open source run. So I think that's another part of it is that because we aren't doing procurement properly, we're also not realizing all the work that goes into it. So we also don't realize that we kind of actually do need to pay people for, for the software we consume, even if it's freely available. But yeah, that's my long-winded, very long-winded, unpopular opinion <laughs> that we are becoming procurement people and we should not be procurement people because we are very bad at it and we should go back to just being software people. YAML slingers. YAML, yes. I mean, this is, this is there's, a, there's a whole lot of, I mean, I guess the Node.js community is a good example of like what happens when you don't do a lot of supply chain analysis and, and vendor management and all of that. You wind up with a, a lot of code that you're kind of like... Uh, where is this all coming from? What is this all doing? You know, what happens if someone nefarious sneaks in and changes something? It's like, well, we, it just, it, that just doesn't happen. It's like, that's all right. If we just put that in terms of other stuff, like if you're, you know, a restaurant, you shouldn't probably be picking chickens up off the street from random people. You should probably be <laughs> having some sort of verified, verified supply chain there. I mean, verified supply chain is pretty important. Yeah. I, I, I think there's some efforts to get there. I think go the way we do things with dependency management's like better, right? Like I think we have some like uh, the the sum database and all of that of actually being able to say yes, this code I got is the code that was in fact shipped by the people. That gives us the 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 platform to build the actual vendor risk management system on top of, but we're, we're still missing that. Like any engineer in most code bases could just pull on any random thing from GitHub and it'd probably be fine. There are a few things coming out. Recently, I think I just saw some stuff floating around about like latest version. Well, at least this latest version of Go, it's all, I can't remember. There are good developments in this area. Yeah. So. We're getting somewhere, but I think we should just get away from procurement. You don't want to do procurement. Procurement's 
I mean, if you do want to do procurement, you're probably not a software engineer. <laughs> Sam, what about you? What's your unpopular opinion? I will give you two the choice. I have one on LLMs and one on the simplicity. Uh, why not both? I'm going to vote LLMs. I'm going to vote both. Just, just, just fire them off. Just, just go. I'll start with LLMs. They are going to significantly displace a lot of the software work that's done today. It's going to happen. A lot of the lies that we tell ourselves about our jobs not being disrupted are things that we're telling ourselves to feel more comfortable. It's going to take a little while, but I think, I think that the basic reason for that is that it's a hell of a lot faster to um, have an answer that's mostly right most of the time for most software purposes than it is to have to engineer something precisely. I, I feel like I don't disagree from a very specific perspective. Like I feel like perhaps if I, if I look at LLMs through the lens of like it's a new kind of compiler, I think I would agree, right? It's kind of like when we first got compilers in general, it's like, yeah, all the assembly programmers kind of, you know, for, eh, all disappear, but it fundamentally changed how we built software. And I think LLMs will likely do something similar, but I think it will, in fact, push us to actually do more of the design stuff we were talking about earlier in the episode. Because so I think, you know, we, we just don't do that right now when we just do a lot of the typey, 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 and then we just don't do any design. So I think, yeah, I think it'll push us to actually design things better so that this thing that can get it right most of the time we can give it and it can spit out something and then we can be like is it right by looking at the design because right now the problem is it spits out something and you're like is it right and you're like well what is right and we have not defined what right is so we have to be able to define right and that feels like where that feels like when we'll actually get to the point of doing software engineering because i still hold that we are not really doing software engineering because we are not doing design we just build software that's it we don't we don't really design it you don't have you know, our design docs are mostly implementation docs right we, we don't sit down we don't do the things that other engineering fields do to actually design the thing i have unpopular opinions about that around like you know if we just called it software design instead of software engineering i think it'd hurt like clear out a lot of the people that want to call themselves it because they have an apprehension to thinking that they're designers instead of engineers anyway this is your unpopular opinion, not mine. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry. What, what do you think that's going to look like? Like, do you feed an LLM a design or do you say, I need a tool that does this, right? I've been spending a few, the past few months, I've been spending time in this area. And I think what we're going to see is more and more broadly reusable. Like, th think of it in terms of more reusable components. You know, right now, like, you can have an HTTP router. Right, because the task of receiving a well-formed HTTP request and then multiplexing that to different handlers, depending on certain properties, like it's all, it's all pretty well defined. But the existence of HTTP routers is predicated on a well-defined problem space that you can, you know, engineer a precise thing around. You can, if you think of a router as like an HTTP router as like a subsystem that you can write generic usable software for, the span of things that we can make agents, LLM, AI-based agents for the things that they can potentially cover. It's, it's a, just a, a larger set. So we're going to see engineering shift towards, uh, well, and also the way that you power those and the way that you configure those, and the way that you compose them into functioning applications. Software will look different when the unit of composition looks so different and can cover so many other areas. I, I, just, I just wonder if, if the, like if the current angle of the legal world where they say things produced by LLMs are not copyrightable. Do you think that changes this trajectory? Like if the, if the thing that it produces is like you can produce it, but you do not own it. Anybody that has it can use it. So as long as there exists frameworks like Langchain, for example, which are the thing that a programmer writes specifies in order to stitch together an overall application that pulls together different agents. I don't think it matters because the output of one agent is and is uses the input to another. And it is the construction of the chain of relations between these that is actually like the copyrightable thing. Right. Okay. Okay. What's your what's your simplicity unpopular opinion? Simplicity is a circle jerk. 
I'm not sure I believe this, but I'm tending towards it. <laughs> that I, I believe this at least as much as I sort of believe the things that we were just saying about it is the sort of path that you are individually walking as you evolve as a programmer, but that ultimately like it's a not reachable destination. And when it's actually like brought up in the context of trying to get a thing done, it's a distraction. We almost never know enough about the problem. And mm. I've only rarely encountered people who are not genuinely making their best effort to solve the problem as they understand it sufficiently well, sufficiently simple. So while it may be a true thing in an individual's head, chasing simplicity as an organization, as a thing you bring up in a meeting, maybe you're just being a <laughs> <laughs> I think I kind of agree with that, yeah. I, I, yeah, I do feel like there are, it's, it's a different type of, yeah, I feel like if you try and bring up software simplicity at an organizational level, it's, pro you're pro it's probably not going to get you to the place that you actually want to be. I, I think that, that that's where you cross from needing to do software simplicity to doing organizational level simplicity. But that's a very different type of, for some reason, extremely difficult work to do. Well, not for some reason. There's a, it's a very specific reason why it's so difficult, but that's a, that's a different podcast. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, I, 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 I see what you're saying, and I don't, I don't know. I feel like I, I agree with, with caveat, with nuance, with a lot of, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of extra stuff you got to add in there. But yeah, which, which makes for a good, unpopular opinion. Ian, what about you? Do you have an unpopular opinion? I can't think of a topical one, but I do have an unpopular opinion. It doesn't have to be topical. I think... There's been a lot of like hoopla and I hope I know what that word actually means. There's been a lot of uproar and like about pre-release video games, right? About how they're bad and how you're giving companies money for unfinished games. I think they are fine. Like I am for pre-release games. Like if you don't want to play an unfinished game, don't buy the pre-released one. Like I, I don't see the problem here. Like hmm. it's not like they're selling you a game and saying, this is complete. Go play it. I don't know. I think the uproar is silly and sensational. And I feel like if you're mad about a pre-release game, it's not for you. And you should just, as you said, not buy it and move on. At least early release also, awesome, man. I mean, it does seem like a more viable way to build video games, though. So I don't know if you have all heard of Star Citizen. Heard of. But it is. Yep. It's, you know, they've spent millions of dollars building this and it's been pre-release for years and people are still saying decade, it's like a Ponzi scheme. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and like, it's obviously not like, I don't know. I think it's silly. I mean, I think people underestimate how difficult it is to build a video game. Interesting. Yeah. I don't know. I, Star Citizen, yeah, looking looking at it from the outside, which I've done a bit of over the years, doesn't look like a Ponzi scheme to me. It looks like a cult. <laughs> That's probably closer to the truth. Oh. You know, the, I can't remember the name of the, the lead designer, of it, but like this was his, you know, white whale project, whatever, and had tried to do all these things at once and told a real good story and got a bunch of people sort of compelled to come along with. And I mean, there, so it's, it's the sort of weird intersection of a Ponzi scheme and cult. And I'm not, I do think it's an honest effort to build it though. It's not. So it is different in that sense. Right. Yeah. There, there's a, there's a real effort to build it, but there is a, there is a degree of don't believe your lying eyes that's required in order to buy in over a sustained period of time mm. that has aspects of uh, maybe, maybe Ponzi scheme actually is better. It's a better way of putting it. It reminds me of all of the grift that we see happening all over the internet. People selling courses about how to get ahead in business that basically amount to a training for how to sell courses about how to get ahead in business <laughs> because that's what worked for the person you bought the course from because you bought the course from them. Yeah. I wonder if it's like, cause I don't, I don't, I've heard of this, but I haven't actually like um, looked into it much, but I wonder if it's like an example of like the underdog syndrome where it's like, because it's been pre-released for so long, you kind of can't release it because then it'll like this whole community people supporting the pre-release will disappear. It's kind of like when the when the underdog becomes the incumbent 
And now it's like, well, now what? Like, I feel like this happened with House of Cards, right? Where, like, the show was all about Frank Underwood being this underdog and being, like, denied what he wanted. And then he got what he wanted. And then it's like, okay, now what? (laughs) I feel like that happens in a lot of spaces. And I feel like people with good intentions, it happens to as well, where they're like, oh, yeah, you just just get stuck perpetually as the underdog. And if you become not the underdog, then the people that were supporting you will kind of turn against you because now you're the incumbent. You're the big bad you know, you're just another person that released a video game. I don't know. That's like my wild speculation about how this could be. Because like, you know, people can be good actors, but still kind of get stuck in this underdog cycle. I see it a lot. I see it a lot in a lot of places in tech where it's just like, you're just so used to being the underdog. You just don't know what to do when you're number one, when you're on top and you've done the thing. But yeah, in general, I would say pre-release video games seem like a cool idea in moderation, like most things. Unless they turn into a party scene. Well, that, that's true of like uh, lots everything. of things, Sam. <laughs> like it is such is the risk of life, right? And the weird way that internet communities can form. Not just yeah. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of things that are Ponzi schemes that are. Uh... It, it, the easier it is to assemble a group of people around an idea, as the internet makes basically frictionless. The easier it is to create these self sustaining communities which self-sustain by being an Ouroboros of their own bullshit. Sorry, I swear. But uh, <laughs> the thing's awesome because I believe that it's awesome and then that feeds back in and makes it a little bit more awesome. I mean, again, it's different mm-hmm. when there's an actual product you play. But there's a common pattern here that has to do with the ability of humans to create collective delusions and hold to them over long periods of time. I feel like this could be a very large subtweet on, uh, on, on on programming languages. I don't <laughs> I would say it's more a subtweet becoming a real tweet on cryptocurrency. Oh, wow. <laughs> Writ large. Financial influencers, the modern culture. There, there's a bunch of things that I can do. But yeah. All right. Before we get too deep. <laughs> too deep. We're, we're gonna there you go. It. Let's just <laughs> turn right away from that. There you go. Yes. Too too deep. Deep. Away. It's like, uh, let's call it there. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's roll this outro. All right. That is go time for this week. Thanks for hanging with us. Subscribe now. If you haven't yet, head to gotime.fm for all the ways. And of course, connect with us on the socials. We are gotime.fm on X and gotime at changelog.social on the Fediverse. Thanks once again to our partners, fasty.com, fly.io, and divesense.org. And to our beat freak in residence, the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. That's all for now. But we'll talk to you again next time on Go Time.